Want to keep your children busy while they gain beneficial knowledge this Ramadan? We have the perfect solution. Download the One for Kids TV app, which features lots of fun and educational videos and songs your children will enjoy. All the content is authentic and music free. Available for download from these platforms or visit www.oneforkids.tv. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the third year of Hijrah, there was something made prohibited, which was clarified very, very clearly in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala tankihul mushrikati hatta yu'min, wala amatum mu'minatun khayrun min mushrika. وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ Do not marry the polytheists, no matter what. It is prohibited to marry those who worship more than one deity, those who worship gods besides Allah or with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Totally prohibited, Allah says, to marry a slave girl who is believing is far better than to marry those who are polytheists. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And this is why Allah has prohibited it both ways. Neither are the men allowed to marry women who are polytheists, nor are the women allowed to marry men who are polytheists. That's the law. It was dictated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not ask questions. Today people say sometimes, why is it the case? Well, common sense is if you cannot even come to common grounds on faith, how are you going to come on common grounds with everything else? And this is why I usually like to give the example of people who have totally different diet requirements. For example, you have a person who is on a seafood diet. When we say seafood, we mean the real seafood, not seafood as in he sees food and he eats, no. But rather seafood as in that which comes from the ocean. And you have another person who is a vegetarian completely. And the two of them get married. The marriage may work, but there will come a time when one will be fed up of the other. Because for how long are you going to be having totally separate kitchens which have cooked totally separate items? If we understand this about food, what about deen, which is far more important? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our generations and may he make us from amongst those who are not confused. And at the same time, may he grant us an understanding. Thereafter, in the fourth year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ was blessed with another grandchild by the name of Al-Husayn ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. The previous year, he had been blessed with Al-Hasan ibn Ali. So Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn radiallahu anhuma, they were not twins. But there was a gap of approximately a year between them. The older being Al-Hasan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu, the younger being Al-Husayn ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. And this was a blessing. The family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was granted a grandson. He had had another grandson known as Abdullah ibn Uthman radiallahu an, who had also passed away in infancy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us children who will be the coolness of our eyes, who will also be able to serve the deen in the same way that Al-Hasan wal Hussein radiallahu anhuma did. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah for having looked after our children and given them the deen. Indeed, it is something very great. Sometimes we have to correct ourselves because I say we need, and this is a fact, sometimes we need attention. We need to be corrected. And yet on our shoulders has been placed the duty of correcting our own children. So we need to take it very seriously. It's a big responsibility. We should not be behaving like little children when Allah has blessed us already with children who look up to us for guidance whilst we ourselves are still in search of guidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and help us to guide our own children. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of his brothers, foster brothers, whose name was Abu Salama. This Abu Salama was the first person who made hijrah. If you recall, his wife, Ummu Salama, was the one who was separated from him when he was making hijrah. 
and his clan came and took the child away as well. She was separated three ways. One is she had lost. Firstly, she was on her own. Secondly, her husband was separated. He was in Medina Munawwara. The child was with the family of the husband and she was on her own being blocked. She says she cried for more than a year. If you recall, we mentioned it a few days ago. And this Umm Salama, radiyallahu anha, her name was Hind binti Abi Umayyah. She lost her husband Abu Salama. And a beautiful discussion uh, had taken place between them before his death. You see, sometimes husband and wife get together and they discuss and they chat out of love. And they say, you know, if I die, don't marry anyone else. And the other one says, if you die, I won't marry anyone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us spouses who are the coolness of our eyes. So Umm Salama says, oh Abu Salama, if you were to die, I wouldn't marry again. I've heard that you would be in paradise with your spouse. And so I won't marry again. Who will be as good as you, O oh Abu Salama? Who is there that can be as good as you in your trustworthiness, your honor, your dignity, your iman, your sacrifice and so on? And Abu Salama said, Oh Allah, when I die, grant her a better husband than me. Subhanallah. This was a dua. And although Umm Salama was quite reluctant, it is reported that after he passed away and after the Idda, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu had proposed to her or had requested and she politely turned it down showed a disinterest the same applies to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu according to the books of history they say that she had politely said no until a day came when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proposed for Umm Salama radiallahu anha one of the reasons was she was obviously a widow she was older than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she had made this quite clear when she accepted the proposal look I'm older than you but at the same time, it was her sacrifice for the deen. She was one of those who sacrificed so much and she had had a great respect amongst the believers, male and female. And the Prophet ﷺ did not want to leave her as a woman who had no guardian and so on. So the Prophet ﷺ proposed for her and he married her ﷺ. Thereafter, Hostilities began once again in the fourth year of Hijrah in Safar. Prior to this, there were a few skirmishes where you find some people had come in, they tried to harm and the Prophet ﷺ sent a small army or a platoon to deal with them and so on. In this particular instance, there was some people who had come to al Madinah al munawwara and they had requested that the Prophet ﷺ send with them some companions to teach them the Quran. And so the Prophet ﷺ sent 10 of his companions. From amongst them was Asim ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu anh. He sent them to a place known as al-Rajiyah. And what had happened, the people who had come requesting in Medina Munawwara, they were a group of people from Adal and Al-Qara. Adal and Al-Qara, two little clans, the Prophet ﷺ sent with them 10 people. When they went on the road, on the path, these people changed their mind. They executed all 10 companions and this was a disaster. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This was a disaster. They sought the assistance of Hudayl. Hudayl was a tribe and they sought their assistance. They executed them. Similar time, round about similar time, there was a group of people with a leader known as Amir ibn Malik. He had come from Najd. And he did not accept Islam, but he had come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He heard about Islam and he was very keen. And he said, look, why don't you send a group of people to Najd? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I fear the people of Najd. They might harm my people. He says, I give my guarantee. With my guarantee, nothing will happen. And as you know, at that time, the guarantees used to work. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent with them 70 Qurra, Qurra meaning those reciters of the Quran who knew the Quran very, very well. And as they left, they got to a place known as Bi'ri Ma'una, where the well of Ma'una was. And what had happened at that particular place, the group of Muslims sent Haram ibn Malhan. He was one of them, radiallahu anhu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him goodness. He was sent with a letter to the leader of Bani Amir, whose name was Amir ibn Tufayl. And this Amir ibn Tufayl, he had had this letter without reading it. He heard these people are Muslimin, he executed this man. 
for no reason. Now, this doesn't happen. You do not execute an ambassador. An ambassador is there to present a message. You either accept it or reject it, or you give back whatever you have to say, either positive or negative, and you let him proceed. From that time up to this day, it is very, very unacceptable to kill an ambassador or execute a messenger who has come to you with a message. Imagine a postman comes to you with a message of someone else and you execute him because you don't like the message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. If that was the case, we wouldn't have postmen at all. Allahu Akbar. So when that happened, it caused a little bit of a disaster. These were 70 men from amongst the Muslimin. And this man who had killed Haram ibn Malhan, what he did is he called his people Banu Amir that come, let's come to my assistance because the rest of them are going to come and attack. Banu Amir said, no, these people have the guarantee of Amir ibn Malik. So we are not going to assist against him and against them. And when that happened, this man, Amir ibn Tufail, he called some other tribes and clans from nearby. Come and help. Who were they? The tribe of Ri'al, the tribe of the Quran, the tribe of Usayyah. They came in and they executed all those companions besides one or two of them who pretended that they were also from amongst the dead, but they had not died. And when this happened, the news got to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was so sad. He was very, very sad. And he made dua for them. And at the same time, they read what was known as Qunut Nazila. Qunut Nazila meaning in Salah, Salatul Fajr, Salatul Isha, the witter of Salah. There is difference of opinion because it was done differently. Sometimes he read in Fajr, sometimes he read in Isha in the witter, sometimes before Ruku', sometimes after, after Ruku'. And this is why up to this day, the dua of Qunut is read either before or after. All of them are valid and correct. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to adopt the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This Qunut nazila, because of this that had happened, and even previously, the Prophet ﷺ had engaged in it. But at this particular time, it's reported that for almost a month, if not a little bit more, the Prophet ﷺ made dua against these people in Salah, these clans of Ri'al and the Quran and so on, those who had engaged in hostilities by executing those believers. Then within Medina al Munawwara, as you know, Banu Qaynuqa were living there and they had been expelled because of what they had done to a Muslim female and because they broke their treaty which was signed when the Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina Munawwara. Now there was another from amongst these people, another group slightly on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara known as Banu Nadir. Banu Nadir, they, they were siding with Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And when the Muslims had suffered some form of loss in, on the day of Uhud, they were from amongst those who were very excited. Even on the day of Badr, they were very upset that the Muslims had won. And they used to cause a lot of problem and a lot of what we would term fitna. And therefore, what had happened, the Prophet ﷺ was already warned about them. And they were waiting for a moment to execute the Messenger ﷺ. So much so, they tried to get him to sit in one place where from the top, they could throw a rock on him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that he could be executed or he could be killed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at the plan. They were caught red-handed. They had hatched the plan. They had ensured Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to sit in a specific place. And then from the top, they were about to throw a boulder and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter sent to them Muhammad ibn Maslamah radiyallahu an, one of the companions and told them, look, you prepare to leave and go away. We are expelling you in goodness. You have broken your treaty. You have intended to harm and to murder and you want to murder the leader of the Muslims, meaning the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You now need to leave this place. We are giving you a short space of time. They began to prepare to leave. As they started preparing, their man came to them. Who was their man? Hypocrites of Medina Munawwara. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. This Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul came to them. The Quran speaks of what happened. 
ألم تر إلى الذين نافقوا يقولون لإخوانهم الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب لئن أخرجتم لنخرجن معكم ولا نطيع فيكم أحدا أبدا وإن قوتلتم لننصرنكم والله يشهد إنهم لكاذبون الله says don't you see the hypocrites they are telling their brethren from amongst the people of the book that if you are expelled, we will come out with you. Which means we are going to stand in support of you. And we will not follow anyone regarding you. And if you are fought, we will fight alongside you. So don't leave, stay where you are, put up a fight. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed the hypocrites about. This hypocrite had gone there. And he told them that, look, we will fight with you. Don't leave. And if they fight you, we will fight back. And why don't you put up a fight against them and so on? And Allah says, Allah bears witness. These hypocrites are liars. La in la If they are expelled, these hypocrites are not going to leave with them. Why would they leave with them? Wala in la And if they are fought, these people are lying. They will not assist them. Not at all. And even if they had to come to help them, they would flee. They would run away. Because the hypocrites don't have anything to fight for. These people of Banu Nadir, they would be fighting for something. But the hypocrites are promising them false promises. So when this had happened, they decided to keep themselves within their fort. They were heavily fortified, Banu Nadir. And they thought this fort of ours, nobody will be able to penetrate it. So what happened, Muhammad ibn Maslama had sent message to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was just on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to them with an army, surrounded them for six nights. He surrounded them and then fear gripped them. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, O Muslims, did not expect them to leave. And they felt that our fortress will protect us from Allah. We won't be able to be harmed. And Allah says, فَأَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَمْ يَحْتَسِبُوا وَقَذَفَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الرُّعْبَ Allah got to them from a, plain, from a point that they had not expected. And fear overtook them. What was the fear that suddenly overtook them in six nights? They remembered Banu Qaynuqa. The Prophet ﷺ surrounded them for two weeks, more than two weeks. And Banu Qaynuqa were then ordered to leave. And so the point of fear that gripped them was this man is a hypocrite. He lied to us and he's not coming to our assistance here. We're putting up a fight. It's been six days. We are surrounded. No one has come to our help. And so therefore they decided to make peace. What was the peace? They said, look, we are seeking from you to leave quietly. We will leave this place, this area. Remember, they were not from there anyway. These people were not from there. They had come from far away from Adru'at and from Asham. And now they went back to Adru'at and to Asham. And some of them stayed in Khaybar. Some of the older people such as Huyay uh, ibn al-Akhtab. Huyay ibn al-Akhtab, he stayed in Khaybar. And the others went further up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ لِأَوَّلِ الْحَشْرِ Surah Al-Hashr was revealed mainly regarding Banu Nadir. And if we go back home this evening and read Surah Al-Hashr, we will find, we will understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. Because now we know Banu Nadir and we know what happened to them. And what they did was something very strange. They were granted respite. They said, we will go. We're not going to take our properties and all that because we won't be able to take anything more than what one camel can carry. So they were allowed a camel each and that camel was to have their belongings on and they were told to leave. Everything else they had to leave. Now they did something strange. They did not want the Muslims to live in their homes after they left. So what did they do? Typical. 
Banu Nadir. They started breaking their houses, destroying their homes, breaking their property, damaging everything. Why? Because they didn't want the Muslimin to come and stay there. So Allah makes mention of this in the Quran. يُخْرِبُونَ بُيُوتَهُمْ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَيْدِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَاعْتَبِرُوا يَا أُولِي الْأَبْصَارِ They were damaging their houses by their own hands and the hands of the believers. Allah says, So therefore, ponder, take heed, learn a lesson. O oh, you who have vision, O oh, you who have intellect, take heed, learn a lesson. Look at how foolish they were. What did they gain from that? Anyway, that was Banu Nadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of them in the Quran. And this is why when they left, they had left quite a lot of their belongings, quite a lot of their wealth and so on. This the Muslims had got without a war. All they did was they surrounded these people who broke the treaty. How did they break the treaty? They wanted to kill the messenger. And on top of that, they aided the, the hypocrites. And on top of that, they were causing lots of fires. And Allah exposed them. So they broke their treaty. The Muslims surrounded them. They left. Now whatever property was there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares this as Al-Fay. Al-Fay is different from Al-Anfal. And Al-Fal are the spoils of war where battle has taken place. We can call it the booty of war or spoils of war. These are all names of the property left behind by the disbelievers after they were fought. And in this case, there was no fighting. So it is called al fay that which the Muslims got without a battle, without a war. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares the ruling about al fay Allah says, مَا أَفَاءَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَىٰ فَلِلَّهِ وَلِلْرَسُولِ وَلِذِي الْقُرْبَىٰ وَالْيَتَامَىٰ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how this fay belongs to Allah and His Messenger and they will distribute it according to the instruction of Allah amongst the poor, the family members and so on and those who are needy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of various uh, categories of people again in Surah Al-Hashr. So this was also a ruling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made mention of in this particular instance. Uh, two people from amongst Banu Nadir accepted Islam. And they were from amongst those who were allowed to stay. They accepted Islam and became very good Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was as far as Banu Nadir go. And as I said, Wallahi, if we are able to read Surah Al-Hashr, the English meaning of it, we would be doing ourselves a great favor by looking at what happened. Very, very interesting. It's quite clear and quite easy to understand. So perhaps we could pick up the Quran and look at Surah Al-Hashr. And, and inshallah read the verses so that we can achieve some of what had happened at that particular time, understand it and learn lesson from it. Then there was something that happened thereafter in the month of Sha'ban. Do you recall that when the battle of Uhud happened as Abu Sufyan was leaving, what did he say? He said next year, same time in Badr, we meet again and he left. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prepared his army and he prepared 1,500 men. According to some narrations, he had almost 60 horsemen and they started proceeding to Badr. Because they had an appointed time with the Mushriks of Mecca. And in the meantime, Abu Sufyan prepared 2,000 men and he started moving also towards Badr. He started moving towards Badr. And thereafter, he hired a man. This man's name was Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud al ashjai So Abu Sufyan hires him and told him, go to the Muslims who are just about leaving Medina and so on. Tell them we have prepared a huge army and we are coming to wipe them out. So this man went and he told the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I am here. Messenger, I am telling you, I am warning you that Abu Sufyan has prepared a huge army coming to wipe you out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this in the Quran. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ 
فزادهم إيمانا وقالوا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل Those whom the people came to them the people here referring to this man Nuaym ibn Mas'ud he was a person he came to them and told them that the people which means Abu Sufyan and them have prepared a huge army against you and they are coming in order to attack you so that statement instead of instilling fear in the believers Allah says it instilled it increased them in conviction and it actually strengthened their iman and they said hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil first statement uttered Allah is enough for us Allah is sufficient for us and he is the best disposer disposer of our affairs now this statement is a powerful statement the hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that ibrahim alayhi salam when he was thrown into the fire he said hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil Allah is enough for me and he is the best disposer of our affairs and it was said again by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the mu'mineen when he was told by Nuaym al-Ashja'i that Abu Sufyan is coming in order to attack you with a huge army and he, the same dua was made again repeated in the Quran and this dua thereafter was made many times how many of us when we first hear news of insecurity do we say hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil Allah is sufficient can I tell you a reality do you want to hear it most of us, when we are given bad news, we swear, Allahu Akbar, may Allah safeguard us. We utter a word that is bad, and we say this instead of saying, Hasbunallah, or Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilayhi Raji'un, Hasbunallah wa Ni'mal Wakil. This is the Sunnah, this is when we will achieve the assistance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, not by swearing the S word and so on. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us protection. We are Muslimin, we have to be real, and we have to change our ways, we have to beautify our tongues. Because it is only with the tongue that is beautiful that Allah can be remembered correctly. That tongue which engages in swearing all day, shouting, vowel la meaning foul language, vulgar words. Do you really think that the same tongue can now in a correct sense do or engage in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, a person who has engaged in the correct sense in the remembrance of Allah will be so fearful to use the same tongue to utter those words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us beautiful words. So this then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marched forth with his army and they got to Badr. And in Badr, a lot of the times there were some markets that took place, some festivals that took place. One was known as Mijannah as well close in that particular area and when the Prophet ﷺ got there there was no one the mushriks of Makkah did not pitch up they did not come so what happened well Allah dealt with them Abu Sufyan was on his way with 2,000 men and when he got to a certain place he turned around he told his people you know what this year there is a drought and our animals are not going to be able to really you know do much we are all lacking some water it's not good to fight in a year like this perhaps we should go back we'll come back the following year they actually in our language chickened out Allahu Akbar they ran away may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us they went back into Makkah to Mukarramah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness this the verses of the Quran I've just read for you Allah says immediately after that they returned with the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nobody harmed them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure as well so this was the result of hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us at all times Experience the power of uninterrupted viewing with our ad-free app One Islam TV, allowing you to connect deeply with the content. Explore the rich teachings of Islam and strengthen your faith through our regular new content. Download the One Islam TV app now.